Welcome back to the Psychopharmacology Review. As we switch from prescription drugs to recreational drugs, it may be helpful to review a couple of key points. First, there is considerable overlap between prescription and recreational drugs, both in terms of specific drugs as well as mechanisms of action. Ketamine, for example, is used clinically as an emergency anesthetic, but is also available on the street as a club drug. Heroin and codeine both share the exact same mechanism of action, yet one is illegal and the other is a prescription. I believe that by studying these drugs together we can gain clear insight into how each class works. Many recreational drugs are simply stronger versions of prescription drugs, but this exaggeration and potency can help us to notice things that we might not have otherwise noticed. Before we start with the individual drugs, I wanted to take a moment to point out the relative potencies and abuse potential for each. You'll notice that strong narcotics such as morphine and heroin are both highly dangerous and have a high abuse potential, while hallucinogens fall at the other end of the spectrum, being neither particularly dangerous nor prone to dependence. The majority of stimulants and depressants fall somewhere in the middle. Remember from earlier that the drugs which stimulate the nucleus accumbens in the ventral tegmental area, which is rich in opioid and dopamine receptors, are the most addictive. Let's begin looking at the recreational stimulants, which includes both legal drugs like caffeine and nicotine, as well as illicit drugs like cocaine and methamphetamine. What ties all of these drugs together is that they have an overall net activating effect on the CNS, increasing mental awareness, motor activity, and autonomic arousal. We'll briefly go over options to help patients quit smoking in this section as well. Let's start our study with the number one most used drug in the world, caffeine. On any given day, 90% of people in the United States will have consumed caffeine in some form. Caffeine is so ubiquitous that many people don't even think of it as a drug, yet one glance at the neurotransmitter profile will remind you that caffeine does in fact have some distinct neuropsychiatric effects. This neurotransmitter profile is seen in the TCAs and the MAOIs, so it should not surprise you that caffeine does in fact appear to have some antidepressant properties, and patients with subclinical levels of depression will often self-medicate with caffeine. Caffeine works by inhibiting adenosine, which is itself an inhibitory neurotransmitter in the central nervous system. By inhibiting an inhibitor, caffeine exerts its excitatory effects, potentiating the three big monoamines, dopamine, serotonin, and norepinephrine. This results in the clinical picture you see here, characterized by cognitive effects such as increased focus and alertness, as well as autonomic side effects including hypertension, tachycardia, and increased urination. Interestingly, Caffeine appears to inhibit GABA at high doses, over 500 mg. This explains some of the extra stimulatory effects, such as anxiety, insomnia, tachycardia, and tachypnea, in those taking caffeine pills or other high-dose forms of caffeine. Caffeine also appears to potentiate acetylcholine, which could explain why people want to use it for studying, as it may enhance memory. Indeed, several studies have found that routine intake of caffeine may decrease the risk of Alzheimer's later in life. Withdrawal from caffeine, especially in regular users, can be uncomfortable, but is not associated with any clinically significant negative outcomes. You don't have to memorize the slide, but for the sake of educating your patients, you should know approximately how much caffeine is found in your garden variety beverages, like coffee, soda, and tea. Patients are often unaware of exactly how much caffeine they are taking in every day, so for those presenting with insomnia or depression, it can help to recommend a caffeine log to see if they are related. As stated before, caffeine does have some antidepressant properties, but by inhibiting sleep, it may actually worsen or prolong depression in the long term. Our next drug, nicotine, is behind only caffeine and alcohol as the world's most commonly ingested psychoactive substance. It is found in cigarettes, cigars, pipes, vaporizers, hookah, snuff, chewing tobacco, and many, many other forms. Like caffeine, nicotine acts as a stimulant, and many patients will use it to self-medicate depression. More so than caffeine, nicotine works on dopamine to affect the drive component, leading to it being one of the most physiologically addictive substances known to man. What contributes to this? A big part of the equation is the speed at which nicotine reaches the brain. After you inhale a cigarette, your brain is awash in neurotransmitters within about 7 seconds, and immediate feedback is well known to play a factor in how addictive something is. Nicotine has distinct psychological and physiological effects. Nicotine's effects on acetylcholine, as well as the three monoamines, lead to a mild stimulant effect, increasing alertness as well as causing hypertension and tachycardia through the sympathetic nervous system. Nicotine also works to suppress the appetite, leading to less caloric intake. Nicotine is unique in that, while it has many stimulatory effects, it also has a sedative effect through the opioid receptor, leading to feelings of calmness as well as working as a moderately potent painkiller. The opioid receptor is increasingly affected with increased dosages and prolonged use, so long-time chain smokers will smoke more to relax than for any kind of mental stimulation. 
Withdrawal from nicotine is associated with irritability, anxiety, and cravings. In addition, appetite is often increased when abstaining from nicotine, so some smokers are resistant to the idea of quitting smoking because they are worried that they will gain weight. You've probably already been hit over the head multiple times with learning the negative effects of smoking, so I won't dwell on them too much here. As a high-yield fact, though, on nearly every test question where it asks, what is the one thing you could do to most improve this patient's health over the long term, the answer is nearly always going to be smoking. So when in doubt, pick smoking cessation. There are two exceptions to this rule. One is hypertension, which you treat with a low-sodium diet or weight loss. The other is gout, which you treat by abstaining from alcohol. So know these two, but for everything else, pick smoking cessation. Because of the enormous health benefits associated with quitting smoking, smoking cessation counseling should be included as part of every doctor's visit, regardless of specialty. Of course this doesn't happen in real life, but it's a good goal to aim for. There are a variety of methods available, from the classic cold turkey approach to counseling and support networks to medication treatment, or oftentimes a combination of these. We'll go over the pharmacologic options in this lecture, but one point I want to hammer home is that it takes more than one time to quit smoking. You as a doctor, as well as your patients, may often get frustrated in these attempts, but the research is clear that it takes on average five to seven times to successfully quit smoking, so keep trying and encourage your patients to do the same. Oddly enough, one of the best options for helping patients to quit smoking is nicotine itself. Many of the negative effects of smoking are not due to the nicotine itself, but to the tars and carcinogens found in cigarette smoke. Therefore, nicotine replacement therapy can manage cravings for nicotine without the negative health effects. Nicotine replacement comes in many forms, such as gums, patches, and inhalers. Nicotine replacement does not wean people off nicotine per se, only cigarettes themselves, so you may find that patients end up being dependent on the replacement gums and patches, which often cost more than a simple pack of cigarettes, so keep that in mind when deciding which form of smoking cessation to pursue. One drug that has been designed specifically to quit smoking is varenicline, brand name Chantix. Varenicline is a partial agonist at the nicotinic receptor and works similarly to how buprenorphine works for opiates, by binding to the receptor without activating it strongly. By doing this, it blocks the effects of nicotine and has been shown to reduce cravings. Of all the pharmacologic options, varenicline is possibly the most effective, with quit rates above both bupropion and nicotine replacement. However, it does carry a black box warning for worsening depression and suicidal thoughts, as well as potentially inducing psychotic symptoms in vulnerable individuals so patients started on varenicline should undergo a thorough psychiatric history before starting. Finally, we have bupropion, which we have discussed before in the antidepressant section. For smoking cessation, bupropion goes by the trade name Zyban, so remember the association of bupropion with butane, and hopefully that will help you remember that it is a good option to quit smoking, especially for patients with a positive psychiatric history who are not eligible candidates for varenicline. Varenicline has better quit rates, but if it worsens depression, then you have a whole other issue on your hand. Bupropion, however, can help with both, so it's a good option for patients with comorbid depression who want to quit smoking. Moving up the ladder in terms of stimulant potency, we arrive at cocaine. Prior to 1907, cocaine was actually not illegal in the United States, and during that time it enjoyed widespread popularity as an energy booster, pain reliever, and stimulant. One look at the neurotransmitter profile should recall a familiar pattern of monoamines, dopamine, norepinephrine, and serotonin. Does this mean that cocaine could act as an antidepressant? Yes, and in fact, Freud was one of the original proponents of cocaine use, recommending it for depression, pain management, and migraines, among other things. Mechanistically, cocaine acts to inhibit the reuptake of monoamines, similarly to SSRIs on serotonin. In addition, cocaine, like lidocaine and other canes, is also a blocker of voltage-gated sodium channels, which explains its use as a local anesthetic, although this use has largely been supplanted by other, less cardiotoxic agents. In clinical situations, as well as on exams, it is necessary to be able to recognize specific substances by their clinical picture, as well as to be able to differentiate between acute intoxication and withdrawal. For stimulants, signs of intoxication are all tied together by thinking of the sympathetic nervous system. By this point, you should be familiar with this. Feelings of euphoria or agitation, as well as physiological signs such as high heart rate, blood pressure, and dilated pupils. Again, this is incredibly high yield. I would become very familiar with this slide. Conversely, many of the signs of cocaine withdrawal are consistent with the opposite of sympathetic activation, where sedation and lethargy predominate. While uncomfortable, withdrawal from stimulants such as cocaine is not dangerous and does not result in death. 
Our next drug, methamphetamine, is basically an amped up version of cocaine with a greater potency and much more addictive potential. In contrast to cocaine, which inhibits the reuptake of monoamines, methamphetamine not only inhibits reuptake but actually forces the release of monoamines from the presynaptic neuron. This accounts for a large part of why the rush of euphoria experienced with meth is so much more immediate, as well as so much more addictive and dangerous. In terms of intoxication, methamphetamine resembles cocaine, although meth seems to have a greater effect on libido and sexual desire. Meth also resembles cocaine when it comes to withdrawal features. Remember from before that withdrawal from stimulants, while incredibly uncomfortable for the patient, is actually not too worrying in terms of morbidity and mortality. Coming off of depressants such as alcohol or benzos, however, is another matter, as we'll get to later. The final stimulant we will cover is MDMA, known colloquially as ecstasy, E, X, or XTC. Ecstasy is probably most well known today for its association with rave culture. MDMA is unique in that it seems to hit serotonin a little harder than the other stimulants, and through the 5-HT1A receptor seems to increase levels of oxytocin as well. Oxytocin, as you might have learned, is considered a crucial aspect in the neurobiology of interpersonal bonding and intimacy. It is released in large amounts when nature wants to promote bonding, such as after childbirth, during sex, and even with simple skin-to-skin -skin physical contact. A large part of the subjective feelings of connection and oneness reported by users of ecstasy likely results from this oxytocin interaction. Like cocaine and methamphetamine, sympathetic activation seems to predominate, although the serotonergic slant to ecstasy induces more of a manic, hallucinatory picture. The withdrawal from ecstasy, known in the club scene as Tuesday Blues or Suicide Tuesday because it typically occurs after a weekend rave, is your classic post-stimulant crash. One symptom that is particularly high yield because it is unique to MDMA is that users often experience bruxism, or intense grinding of the teeth during sleep, which can help you to recognize an MDMA withdrawal picture. Hopefully the X in bruxism will remind you of XTC. Getting close to the end now, just a few more sections to go. Come back when you're feeling refreshed.